This is a podcast produced by Ashridge Business School. Um, I'm here to represent the Alumni Association, um, who's organising the event, and um, uh, introduce our, our speakers for this evening. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Fiona. Hello. And, uh, uh, I'll hand over to, to you. So thanks very much indeed, and uh, enjoy thank the evening. Thank you, Neil. Well, thank you very much, Ashford, for inviting me here tonight, and my colleague Jessica. We're both nutrition consultants for the Russell Partnership, and we've worked a lot with Ashford over the past couple of years, helping Graham Russelling, the head chef there, and his team to really bring the food up to sort of optimal standards, not just to taste delicious, as I'm sure you'll rem remember from your time at Ashford, but also to be positively good for you, so to help your learning um, experience at Ashridge, so to help memory, mood, concentration, energy levels, etc. And in fact, that's our topic here today. So we all know that nutrition is incredibly important, and we're all meant to eat our five a day and have our oily fish, etc. But less well known is the impact that food and drinks can, uh, can have on our brain's ability to function, so both positive and negative impacts. So things like memory, sleep, stress levels, energy, concentration, all clearly of paramount important when you're, importance when you're at work, could be being affected by your diet. Um, and so that's something that we'll look at in a little bit more depth today and hopefully give you the knowledge to make a few tweaks to help boost your own performance in the workplace. So without further ado, I will just run you through the content of this evening. So starting off, I'll be running through foods for the brain. So things that are positively good for your brain and things that are not quite so good, sadly and principles of a balanced diet, so giving you a no-nonsense guide to those foods that might sustain energy levels and concentration and those things that would hinder it. And Jessica will be leading that section, as um, also for the what's on the label section. So giving you a little bit more understanding about how to interpret food labels. I'm sure you'll all agree that if you look at the front cover of a cereal packet, for example, it might give a very different picture than the small print in the ingredients list on the side. So just giving you a few more skills to actively or, or more accurately interpret the, the content and therefore the, um, the quality of a food product behind the advertising jargon. And last, or second to last, we'll have a quick quiz playing for prizes, so please do concentrate. And we'll just sum up with a policy for the workplace. So things you might want to take back to your own place of work or think about for your own diet or for that of your employees. So let's start with food for the brain. Does anybody recognize this strange chap here, the broccoli head? That, sorry? That is, it's the, it's the logo for food for the brain, which is an educational charity. And Ashridge has the considerable achievement of being the first institution in the UK to have gained accreditation by food for the brain. And that means that its menus have been approved as providing all of the nutrients that are going to actively help its delegates, its attendees, and its employees to make the most of their time while they're at Ashridge, whether they're working or they're studying. And it started off in schools, in underperforming primary schools, a little bit like Jamie's school dinners campaign, but a, a lot more all-encompassing. And it's actually been incredibly successful. So things like SAT scores, children's behaviour, all monitored over a year period and big improvements were found um, according to parents, um, teachers, sort of councils uh, assessing um, school performance, etc. So it's, it's had a big impact on children and obviously that means that it doesn't just apply to children so it's now got a much wider remit and we're working with higher education institutions, so universities, business schools, <coughs> conference centres, and indeed business and industry. So let's take a look at current health trends. Starts off quite pessimistic, I'm afraid, but we'll get a little bit more optimistic towards the end. So may not surprise you to hear that work-related stress is the second biggest occupational health problem in the country. Any guesses as to the first? Back pain. And this is a surprising statistic. 25% of adults have been diagnosed with depression. So that's not just ticking a box in a Daily Mail questionnaire saying, do you feel a bit glum on a Monday morning? That's going to your doctor and being diagnosed with clinical depression. So a, a really quite depressing statistic. And the same amount of people in this country are now clinically obese. And a lot more are getting on their way to being that way. I think 75% of the country are classified as overweight. 
So very, quite literally a very big issue. And sick leave costs our economy a huge amount of money each year. So not very uh, rosy picture in terms of the nation's health as a whole. But if we look at those health trends in the light of food trends, it's quite interesting to see the link between how we're choosing to eat and drink and the impact that may be having on our health. So, snacking. Would you all agree that we tend to snack more now than we used to? So in this time-poor environment, we, we, we're far more likely to just grab a sandwich from Pret than sit down and have a lovely, long, leisurely lunch. And in fact, if trends continue in, in a decade's time, or less than a decade actually, we'll have flipped over from three main meals a day and the odd snack to having a much more of a snack routine to get our um, daily calories and it'll be the odd sit-down meal as a rare occasion with family and friends. And I don't actually think we'll get to that point. I think the tide is already turning as our awareness increases. But nonetheless, if trends did continue unabated, that's where, where we would be, which seems somewhat sad. And accordingly, the time we spend cooking and preparing meals has dropped dramatically. So we used to spend an admirable two hours um, in the 1980s, that was per day, preparing our meals. Dropped to 20 minutes in the year 2000. Any guesses what it fell to in 2007? <laughs> Someone's got their favourite ready meal recipe off by heart. Um, no, it's actually 15 minutes, so not quite that bad. But, I mean, 15... Yes, quite. So that's, that makes time for a cup of tea. I mean, 15 minutes, actually, when you think of pouring your cereal or putting your toast in the toaster or bread in the toaster in the morning, grabbing your sandwich or salad at lunchtime and perhaps having your takeaway, your ready meal or going out for supper or making some pasta in the evening. As I'm sure a lot of people, you know, that might be a typical diet for a lot of people, um, 15 minutes seems quite generous. And we're spending more money on diet products than ever before. So the fatter the nation gets, the more the diet industry rubs its hands with glee. And also allergy-friendly foods. So the free-from market, that's things like the soya milks, the gluten-free biscuits and breads and pastas, seen a huge increase in sales as the rates of allergies and food intolerances have soared. So really, if we put those slides together, we can see that as a nation, we're spending less time cooking and less time eating than ever before. But somewhat paradoxically, we are fatter than ever, soaring rates of stress and depression, obesity um, and food allergies. So our relationship between food and health has, has fallen somewhat out of kilter. This podcast was produced by Ashridge Business School.